uh, this is anubama bharti uh, i would like to welcome you all in the session of uh, varta lab talk show organized by isola mp chapter madhya pradesh on the occasion occasion of world landscape architecture month i would like to thanks all the participants and the me members of the managing committee of isola mp chapter who has given me this wonderful opportunity so uh, today's speaker does not need any kind of introduction as he known worldwide for his impressive and mesmerizing talks and architectural landscape projects uh, it is an immense pleasure and honor for me to introduce professor neelkan chhaya professor neelkan chhaya is an architect and academic he has practiced at ahmedabad since 1987 and taught at faculty of architecture at sept university from 1987 to 2012 where he retired as dean of the faculty he also taught earlier at the university of nairobi at institute of environmental design balla vidyanagar and has been an adjunct faculty at shishti school of design bangalore he edited harnessing the intangible collected essays on the work of balakrishna doshi national institute institute of advanced studies in architecture 2014 professor chaya has been interested in the value of indic thought on architecture urbanism and place making to contemporary practices so uh, please join me in welcoming professor neel kan chaya so sir the now the audience is yours so a very warm welcome uh, to you here on the session of uh, uh, vartala talk show thank you very much anupama um, i will share screen now yes yes sir can my screen be seen yes sir yes yeah. sir yeah okay it's a very great uh, pleasure and honor to be invited by isola uh, the madhya pradesh chapter to speak today uh, of all the professional organizations isola seems to be doing the most interesting work and i'm always quite happy to be part of its activities the topic i was told um, as the topic for this month is landscapes of the new normal and this led to me to think about what all has been happening to us during this whole year and more of the new normal a virus came and it affected lives and it continues to affect everything about the activities of human beings and it asks us perhaps to think more as to what is our relationship to the whole of reality the subject is such that there is more to think about and less to tell or less to show rather so i will be talking more i'm afraid that this uh, presentation talk will be word heavy and it will require uh, all of us going together into this whole subject so without further ado let me launch into the kind of thoughts that have occurred to me once i started thinking about this topic if we look at the new normal and we look at our recent experiences the experiences of the last year or so perhaps we may be able to see three false conceptions that human beings have held over the last 2 300 years but much more in the last century or so 
these three false conceptions drive all our ideas of what we should do in the world, how we should live. So I will say that the first misconception is that space is uniform and empty. We all know the Cartesian uh, space that we are taught in geometry of a completely even, extensive, undifferentiated, mathematical space where x, y and z coordinates can tell you positions in that space. And I will explain why I consider that that conception is an inadequate conception. The second is that we live in time which is linear. That from the past into the future is an arrow of time which never has, never can go back, nor, uh, and it will continuously move forward. And in human terms, it is connected to the idea of progress, of continual progress that we will have more and more knowledge. This is related to the third false conception. And that is that we humans have agency as the ability to control world process. I'm not using the word nature here, I'm using the word, word, world process, because nature has become uh, some way of removing humans from, from nature, that we consider ourselves not being in nature. But that apart, we came to believe in the last two, three centuries, that as we have more and more knowledge, we will be better able to control what goes on in the world around us. That we will be able to use this uniform space and linear time and our actions within it will help us to control what goes on. These three false conceptions come home to us with a bang with the arrival of the virus. How? The first thing is that the meaning of distance, which is a, which is a quality of space, the meaning of distance changed. Far away and nearby are no longer the same as what they used to mean to us before. The virus replaces the human as a tourist, exploring all the corners of the earth. Where did it come from? Was it far away? Was it nearby? When it attacks me, is it the far away thing which is attacking? Is there any distance left that what was there, what was never there in the place that I am in, suddenly is there, has covered distance. So there's nothing far away anymore. What was far became near. And what is near becomes frightening. That the virus might be in the crannies of our nearby objects, nearby humans. 
So instead of nearness, we seek distancing now, social distancing. So what, what was the meaning of far? Far was something which one needed time to go to. Near was that which was immediate. That changed. It's changed so radically. That space, that first category that we are looking at, is no more uniform, can't be thought of as uniform without differentiation, purely geometric and quantitative. But it is now distinctive. It is contextually distinctive, that means varies from place to place to place and in the most sort of uh, practical manner, we might say that some places have more cases and other places have less cases and so on. So space became di differentiated, it is physically differentiated and psychologically it means what was there, what is public space, what is private space, what is my room, what is my bed, all of that now becomes the differentiations of space. So that in the new normal, it is no longer possible to think about that mathematical space which we can deal with as we like. The meaning of now changes. The virus moves instantaneously, within days or hours or minutes, even seconds, the world is not what it was. My world is no longer what it was, because this new phenomenon has come in, which can move instantaneously and, make, and suddenly somebody who was completely without any uh, problems becomes somebody who is a case. But also, what happened yesterday is inextricably entangled in tomorrow. The fact that such and such moved and was able to find lodging because of something that we did, will affect our tomorrow. So we can no longer think of a time in which there is a linear progression from past through the present to the future, but that the future and the past are simultaneously existent right here in every second of our, of our being. We no longer have the luxury of leaving the past behind. Time no longer moves in one direction towards a ever greater progress. So if space changed, time also changed. That our conceptions of undifferentiated space and of linear time both are being shaken to the roots by this tiny little thing, tiny little form of life that has occurred, suddenly come into our attention. And it is asking the most profound questions of philosophy or of existential dilemma. And I believe that landscapes are as much questions of existence as they are of reordering or ordering or generating, regenerating, etc. So once these two change, then our orientation towards ourselves and everything around us will have to change.
the meaning of control has changed. We had begun to believe that with knowledge we could control and dominate world processes. Still, quite a few of us believe that it is so, that we will control and dominate world processes. Right up to 2020 February, March, we thought that was absolutely true. And sometime in February or March, this little tiny thing suddenly made the whole question of control collapse, the virus deflated that balloon of thought. It is no longer possible to be in control. Almost even now, we had thought that we were in control and by September we had found control over the virus. But again, now it's become active all over the country. What is it doing? Which means that our actions as human beings are not decisive, are not something that will say, yes, if I do this, that will happen. But they are exploratory. That our actions are kind of tentative feelers into reality that we say, let's try this, let's do that. Maybe it changes, yes, perhaps, okay, good, but well, maybe still try something more, etc. That human agency, the ability of humans to make a difference, is not independent or superior of world process. But it is rooted, it is in participation in world process. That we are not, we are not creatures sitting outside on top of natural processes, able to control them at will. It's tried to tell that to us many times, but now with the virus, it is telling it most, most dramatically that we are part of, we participate in what goes on in the world. And if you think about the design of landscapes or the working of landscapes, as something where you are participating in the process of what goes on in the world. Maybe one starts thinking differently. Maybe one starts doing different things. So, to summarize this first part, the idea of space as uniform, undifferentiated, the idea of time, as just hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. So I was summarizing that the idea of space and the idea of time and the idea of agency, all have been put to doubt. Space as uniform and undifferentiated, time as linear and moving from past into the future, and agency as control. All these three have been put to test. This would mean, and if there is anything that we designers can learn from the new normal 
it is that the very conception of design will change. We will no longer be able to think of design in the manner in which the dictionary has put it down. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines design as one, to create, fashion, execute, or construct according to plan. Which means that everything is sorted out and a plan is made. Plan goes A, B, C. You do that and you achieve what you want to achieve. That's the first thing. It says about design. Second, to conceive and plan out in the mind. That means the, the intelligence or the rational capacity of human beings as the basis for deciding what to do. Third, to have as a purpose. Purpose that there is something for which something is being done. And then fourth, to devise, for us mm. to devise. That means we make devices, we make, we make contraptions for a specific purpose or end. So it is always the end in mind, not the means. How shall we do it is not important. So this notion of design, which uses plan, mind, purpose, device, and end. This is being put to question. Is it true? All of these definitions require us to consider ourselves capable of complete and unerring forethought that you are able to think out every possible contingency and put it into such a plan that it can't go wrong. So we have, we have to believe that we are capable of complete and unerring forethought and of precise and accurate action. Once having forethought, then we think through and have take action which is precise and accurate. I wonder, after the coming of COVID, can we at all be sure that we have forethought, that we have unerring forethought, that our actions are precise and accurate, any honest uh, evaluation will tell us that no. It also requires us to consider ourselves free to pursue our own purposes, irrespective of context and ethical value. Doesn't matter what it is, you decide what is to be done, follow it through, to devise for a particular purpose or end. This definition of design is also in question because if for example uh, doing something will reduce the diversity of biotic life will reduce the possibilities of geological formation will reduce this that and the other or will change it drastically should it be done or not this is the question that is there before every landscape architect, every architect, every designer. Can we this pursue purposes without, without considering the ethical value of those? So that if that definition of the dictionary is true, it means that to design, we have to consider space, time, and agency in the old way, which I've explained is false. 
So then what happens? If that definition of design is wrong, is false, is not based on, on true observation of what is happening, what should we do? Meanwhile, and I have been fortunate to live during the time of the pandemic, mostly a few kilometers from Ahmedabad. And my wife has gone for a walk every day. And she has taken these photographs. And humans were in trouble. But nature just continued. The world process went on. See how it happens. That means that last point that I'm trying to make is are we concentrating too much on what human beings need? Should we be thinking of all world process <clears throat> and ourselves as part of it? These things, all these four photographs and the others that I will show, they have taken during this one year, between March 2020 and April 2021. And nature has, has proliferated as it always did. Whether it is growth or decay, whether it is drying out or greening, all those are ongoing processes of the world. So what to us was a huge challenge was not so. And the rest of life, it continued. Is there something that we are missing out of the picture? Is there something that we got wrong? And I suggest that yes, we did. So if we observe ongoing world process, some questions arise. First, is nature creative or repetitive? Comes up with the same kind of leaves, the same kind of flowers, but every flower is different from its neighbor flower of the same plant, slightly different. So is nature creative or repetitive? Because we call ourselves creative people. We call ourselves as designers creative. Is nature creative or is it repetitive? Is it simply copying the last genetic material? Second question. What does the new or innovative or creative mean? Is there anything new that nature does? Well, yes, it created the virus. <laughs> yes. But is it interested in the new or the innovative? Or is it interested in the happening of life, of the continuance of life. Third, why do the same patterns look fresh? You look at a plant, you look at a tree, you look at a field of grass. Looks fresh, even if it's just the same as what it was yesterday, a month ago, or every year it's the same, still, in the morning, we wake up and it looks fresh. What is it that makes this happen, where I'm never bored of that sameness? Fourth question, is growth better than decay? And we saw in the photographs, some decaying parts of plants. How beautiful they are. Drying out leaves, uh, funguses, uh, which are 
which are breaking down the organic matter, how wonderfully structured they are. So is decay, what we call decay, what we call growth, is there some way of understanding life processes not as either growth or decay? Fifth, are all these processes interconnected? Because it would seem that the leaf and the butterfly and the spider and the bird and the sky and the rain or the sun, they all seem to affect each other. Whereas we think of ourselves and the objects that we design as separate things, which are not connected, we, we draw them on paper as if they are not connected to anything else. So these are some questions which nature put to me. Sixth question, what is monotony and what is variety? In my work, I, am I not trying to avoid monotony and do something new, some variety? Why is nature, which is doing the same thing over and over again, why does it not lack that variety? Seventh question, why do these processes create such great diversity? And not a sameness, not a monotone. How is it? Is what we see chaotic, messy or orderly? If you see a growth of weeds, even that, doesn't look messy, chaotic. What is that sense of order? What then is order and design? Is order the categorization of similar things all by themselves into different boxes? Or is it some kind of a living interaction between different types? What is design? These questions are to be, to be hanging over us. Tenth question. Are the remains of yesterday ugly and unpleasant in that world, in that world of leaves? You know, we had this just two months ago, there was this huge fall of leaves. And those leaves went back into the soil and even the dried leaves, they looked wonderful and the sound they made was different. So why are the remains of yesterday not ugly, not unpleasant? Or put the question another way, will tomorrow's flowers and leaves be different? Should I expect that tomorrow there will be a different flower? Will they be better than yesterday's flowers? Or hundred years back flowers? In what way? Put this question to your own designs, which gets so obsessed that it should be different from what you did last year, or what human beings did 50 years ago that it should be contemporary, it should bring about something better. Why is world process not concerned with that? In the end it says, what kind of time rules and unifies world process? Rocks and soils, and plants and creatures and air and water and sky, all of them live in different kinds of time, different durations of time. Rocks last for a long time, thousands of millions of years. Soils 
plants for a day, maybe some creatures, some insects for a, a few hours at the most. And yet, they are all in one time, simultaneously, different times. What is it about time which we have misunderstood? What is it about space and our agency that we have misunderstood? The biggest questions, what or who decides all that happens? Is there a designer? Perhaps if one were pessimistic, one would say that in the absence of designers, the world in its random movements is wonderful. <laughs> is it random? Or is it design? Is what we see in a tree and its beautiful cycles of flowering and fruiting and leaf fall and then again growth and spring, is it random? Is it design? Or is it neither? Is design pre decided? Or is it constantly happening? That in the very act of life happening, there is design simultaneously happening. How about if we thought like that? That every time I walk, there is a sense of, of design emerging from my action in gravity and on different kinds of surfaces and my, in, my desire to be near that or away from the other thing. But that every time I pick up a pencil, it's less about what I think previously, but more about paying attention to what is happening right there. Is our understanding of design completely wrong? And last, how are all these forms interacting and participating? Why is it that we don't see wars? Why is it that we see that the spider eating the insect is a gentle phenomenon happening? In proportion, unless interfered with by humans, the proportions go askew the moment human beings start trying to control. And then you have to have pesticides and you have to have all kinds of herbicides, all kinds of things. So observing the ongoing world process through this year, the questions brought about a fundamental need to relook at what we consider is our action what we consider is design. So what would be the new meanings of design? And I will continue with the same three categories, space, time and agency. So the first thing is that specific place replaces universal space. Now, this word place has been bandied around rather poorly. But you have to understand that it, it condenses huge amount of meaning from geographies and psychologies to biologies and, and uh, geologies. All those are in this idea of place, every square inch of the earth and a human in that square inch of the earth is a place which is distinct, specific. And it's not uniform and universal. 
Second, simultaneous time, past, present, future, all of those existing simultaneously, inter interconnected, interactive, a kind of tangle of processes of time exists, not this straight line or the arrow of time as progress. Third, our agency is about participation rather than control of the world process. If we understand these three, then our whole notion of design starts changing. So, can we imagine the characteristics of this new conception of design? So first, if time is not linear, but simultaneous, there can be no old and no new, only resonances of motives across time. I'll try and show you some of that, but keep this sentence in mind. Time is not linear then, there is no old, there is no new, there is no anxiety about creating the new. Then you are able to act in a different way. You are able to listen to what is existent in the place that you are in. And listening leads to resonance of a tuning in and an action that arises out of that. So tuning in to the reverberations, to the vibrations of time might be a very wonderful activity as the designers step into participating in the world. This kind of tuning in results in repetitions. But no repetition is without transformation. Even if you just say A, 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 the fourth A and the twentieth A are not in the same location. And, they, and as it happens, as I keep on making that sound even, it never comes out exactly the same. Therefore, this idea of repetition is bad may have to be put aside and we might start learning something different about it. Patterns of relationship that continually respond to place. So design is about patterns of relationship or motives, which I've mentioned in the first sentence, are about patterns of relationship that continually respond to place or the field or the context of enactment, where it is happening, when it is happening, who is doing it, all those things are folded in, are, in, are woven into the design that is coming into being. Next, participation of many. So we think that we are doing landscape design then there will be a gardener who will actually go and execute the landscape design. But if you had a bad gardener and you had an excellent gardener, what a difference it would make to the manner in which your feeling for that place would be brought to fruition. That there is no, and it might also need the action of so many insects and so many kinds of creatures, earthworms, and water of different kinds, and soils, and sunlight, and all of that. So that individual agency, we think of ourselves as individuals who take charge and try to control reality. Instead of that, we are participating in a multi-cornered, complex process in which we hesitantly, tentatively, try to pull at one entangle or the other and try to weave together what we are feeling. Out of that comes about a living design arising 
out of nothing or out of the previous existent, resonating, growing, then dissolving, then arising again, resonating, growing, dissolving, arising, and so on. And this, therefore, the time is no longer linear in all living processes. We think that to make new is important. So just to put aside that false belief, I'm going to show you some works by Picasso, the great artist. Everybody agrees that he was one of the most creative people of the 20th century. Hugely creative, revolutionary. And what was he doing? He was carefully looking at African masks. The two pictures on the left. Left hand side, extreme left, African mask. The middle one, Picasso's drawing. Look at the two on the right. Is there something happening here? Is there some resonance happening? That Picasso is not copying the mask but he is listening to the vibrations of that. And in his own heart, there is a kind of uh, resonance with that. And wonderfully, something new emerges, which is the same as what was the old. What the African artist found and Picasso found are of equal value. Two other examples. So it is not necessary for the new to be a rejection or a complete coming out of ex nihilo, you know, out of the nothing. But it is resonance across time. Think about that. And in nature, this is happening that there are repetitions. On the left, all these flowers repeat the pattern, repeat the pattern, but transform as they repeat. So much of the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, but same with little different, same with little different, according to the position, according to the location, according to the specificity of place. Repetitions are not, are not monotonies. Here you have got two works of art from India. One is on the left hand side, the huge, the great sculpture at Mahabalipuram, called the descent of the Ganges. One side of it has all these gods flying up into the sky and see how each god has got the same posture more or less, slightly different, slightly different, and how the whole thing is in movement with these wonderfully repetitive figures. The, the artist could have been told, listen, each god is a different one, why do you want to make all these same type things? But no, the right hand raised the left hand to one side, and the god is flying up into the sky. Right foot lifted, left foot stationed. And so there, there is the jump off. And each one in their own distinct way. What a beautiful use of repetition. But there's another kind. In the Pichwais of Nathadwara, you can see on the right, the cows, they form a kind of vibrating pattern of a rhythm of movement. And the trees do the same, the sky does the same, the peacocks in the bottom do the same. And the whole thing is repetition upon repetition upon repetition upon repetition. And it is a kind of a, of a kind of... Uh, Japa, 
you know, a kind of existence of a repetition which is really creative. So as designers, this obsession with the absolutely new, the unprecedented, is something which I feel was an aberration. And it has led to the way in which we have destroyed the world so that the virus was able to come and occupy it. Here's another set. Pictures done by ordinary Indian people on the walls of their houses in Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Rajasthan. These photographs by wonderful photographer Jyoti Bhatt many years ago. Look at it. Look at the pictures. See the repetitions. Two dogs, one is the, or the two peacocks, one to the other. Same symmetry, same symmetry. And it keeps on doing that. And the whole circle on the floor. And at the back of these children, the little motifs, repeating, 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 repeating. What is it that gives so much joy? And there, I think we have to ask ourselves the question: Have we have we defined design wrongly? But it's not only the old people who did that. Here is a there was a great great Indian artist by the name of Nasreen Mohammadi at Baroda, and this is her work in ink on paper. And it's about repetition. But see the vibrating quality of it. That she's interested in the precision of that repetition. And the slightest change from that precision, slight change in the thickness of the line, and the picture starts vibrating. And you see a sort of cone of movement where there is none in other in actuality. How is it that she is using simply the straight line, the repeated straight line to get this? And here is another work by a great op art artist, Bridget Riley. Try to look at it. It's just repeated lines. The same line, repeated, repeated, repeated. See what happens to your eyes if you look at the lower one. In the upper one, there's no color. She has not used color in it. But the manner in which the, the lines are put gives you an illusion. The abhas, as we call it in, in Indian languages, of color is is emerging out of them, so that it has become a living thing. And sometimes unconsciously, there are things like that, which we can see if we look carefully. So on the left hand side, there's a miniature painting by Udaipur artist. This is an old one. And a more recent painting on the right, by V. S. Gaitonle, one of our greatest painters. And in my thinking, if I close my eyes, half close my eyes, then I can see that the same vibrations are of, from vertical, from top to bottom, is happening in different ways. So patterns of relationships that continually respond to place, the field of the context of enactment. And a very simple example here, the temple is a form, the shikhara, the garbhagriha, the mandapa in front is a form that happened all over North India. But see how it happened in Palitana, which is at the top of a hill and how that magnificent 
drumming of the of the shikara down the hill and at the river bank and in banaras his two temples stand like sentinels firm in, in the face of the river the same thing but they are enacted differently you can look at the details of these two temples in banaras and you will find little details are changing that they are so sensitive to the context of it and you look at the palitana temple the same thing you will find that what is the job given to the to the the, the shilpakar make a temple you say oh temple i know it's just a shikhar and the mandapa always the same and you see what they produce that this notion that there has to be something new was a notion that they put aside and they enjoyed making what they were making and they playfully inserted things in them somewhere a little dome somewhere a pyramid of stone somewhere and it starts doing something or the simple builders of Greece on the Greek islands, every house is just painted white. Every house is roughly the same, made out of stone and plastered in lime. Every street, almost the same. No, not one, not the same. But this is something where. A pattern of relationship is resonating across the island. It's just going on from house to house to house, and it keeps on happening. And the participation of many individual agency subsumed in the process. So this is a Dogon village in North Africa. Each house is almost the same as the next house. Slightly different, maybe. But see what a wonderful landscape of construction that they have. They're not different, and yet they're different. But it comes about as a participation. All know what is my neighbor doing? What is the way in which we build in mud? How to make a chimney? what to do with the roof, all those things are knowledge which is shared and shared and shared. And you get this wonderful anonymous, where no star architect is shouting. This is what you get. Or here, this is in Karnataka, a small village in Karnataka called Bendegumbali. And you see all of them built with the same kind of material, same kind of detail, same kind of... But everything is different. And what a wonderful sharing, what a wonderful participation in the process of making a, an environment in which we live. And you can see that the humans in the right-hand side photograph are also of the same kind of thing. They are all the same, they are all different. And then, in nature, we can see straight away this last point about the design process that I wrote there, rising, resonating, growing, dissolving, arising. It's a cycle which goes on and on in nature. And we, in nature, we accept it unthinkingly. How about if we think about our own design processes like that? Like the Japanese Ise Shrine. Every 20 years, they demolish the old one and build a new one. You can see there are two sides, one on the right and one on the left. So that one at the back on the right is old. And it is being uh, carefully 
removed. In the meanwhile, the new one has been built. And there is a ceremony of the rebirth of the shrine. 20 years from this date, again they will take this one which has grown old, dismantle it, build the new one. And it will go on. For hundreds of years this has been going on. Arising, resonating, growing, dissolving. In Gaitonde's paintings we see it all the time. That you, if you stand in front of this canvas, you can see the glimmerings of groups, which again dissolves back into the background. Continually, this is happening. Can this happen to the landscapes that we design? Can this happen to the buildings that we design? What kind of a design process leads to this? So now I'm going to read you three quotations from a very important philosopher and scientist by the name of Karen Barad. And I want you to listen carefully. So the first one, in my view, is about place. The redwoods, the ocean, the paths taken, and those which may yet have been taken, hold the memory of these explorations by foot and by mind. We are being churned by the soil, the wind, the foggy mist. Listen to that sentence. We are being churned by the soil, the wind, the foggy mist. A multiplicity, an infinity in its specificity, condensed into here, now. Each grain of sand, each bit of soil is diffracted, entangled across space-time, responding, being responsible, response able to the thick tangles of space-time matterings, this is a word that she coins, space-time matterings that are threaded through us, the places and times from which we came but never arrived and never leave, is perhaps what returning is about. So every act of design, in my view, is a returning to those space-time matterings that are threaded through us. One can meditate on this for a long time and get more out of it. His thoughts on time, memory, the pattern of sedimented enfoldings of iterative intra-activity. Listen to this, memory, the pattern of sedimented enfoldings of iterative intra-activity is written into the fabric of the world. The world holds the memory of all traces, or rather, the world is its memory, and in brackets, enfolded materialization. That means all memories are folded in. If, if I pick up a piece of soil or a, or a leaf, there is an entire enfoldment of memory of material within that, so that everything that I deal with is memory. Past and future are iteratively reconfigured and enfolded through the world's ongoing interactivity. Phenomena are not located in space and time, rather phenomena 
our material entanglements enfold it and thread it through the space-time mattering of the universe. So we don't have a site which has a boundary line and which we can cut off from the rest of the land. But it is something which is enfolded and threaded through the space-time mattering of the universe. So that that particular place where you are designing the landscape is enfolded and threaded through and thick with the memory, thick with the space-time mattering of the whole universe. And that you do little bit here and the universe changes minutely. What a wonderful way to think about design. That your every small action is a change in the state of the universe. What a way. And then what we do, what is our agency? To address the past and future, to speak with ghosts, is not to entertain or reconstruct some narrative of the way it was, but to respond, to be responsible, to take responsibility for that which we inherit from the past and the future. We inherit from the past and the future for the entangled relationalities of inheritance that we are. To acknowledge and be responsive to the non-contemporaneity of the present. That means the present is not only the now. It's not only the now. To put oneself at risk. To risk oneself, in brackets, which is never one or self. To risk oneself, which is never one or self. To open oneself up to indeterminacy in moving towards what is to come. It's not as if only the, you know, philosophers and, you know, some vague people are thinking like this. Just to show that all over, in all the fields today, there is a realization of a different kind of time, a different kind of space, a different kind of agency. On the left is the cosmology. Of uh, Roger Penrose, where he proposes with a thick background of mathematics to it that universes come into being and they disappear, and they dissolve, and again a new universe comes into being and dissolves. A new universe comes into being and dissolves. And he's showing this mathematically. He's proposing that this is the way the universe is come and go. So that huge scale is one. On the other side, in, uh, in neuroscience, you can see here the entanglements of the neuronal web. And it's continually growing. And you can see that there are little openings in that neuronal web, but there are also densities, there are repetitions, there are reoccurrences, there are resonances growing, dissolving. So all the fields are beginning to sense that what we said about space and time and human agency, all of those things are inadequate. That the linear form of understanding, which says life goes to death, look at the arrow on the left, top left, or it says good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. Huh? That was one sort of not so great way of thinking. 
But look at the circular way of thinking. There's birth, aging, sickness, death. Birth, aging, sickness, death. In the, in the most practical form. But in a philosophical sense, there is formation, existence, destruction, emptiness. Formation, existence, destruction, emptiness. Formation, existence, destruction, emptiness. And circles within circles of that same kind. Think about it. Do you think maybe that our work is one of those small circles moving from formation to existence to destruction to emptiness? Or that we have entered at a point of the emptiness and will go towards formation, existence and destruction? Or we have entered at any other of the three points, four points, that we are in this, this tangle of time. So now we are almost at the end of this long rant that I have made. I end with two quotations from a very important psychoanalyst named R.D. Lang. And this is from his book, The Politics of Consciousness. Man, most fundamentally, is not engaged in the discovery of what is there, nor in production, nor even in communication, nor in invention. These are not the important jobs of man. Huh? He is enabling being to emerge from non-being. This is a profound sentence. Man is enabling being to emerge from non-being. The experience of being the actual medium for the continual process of creation takes one past all depression or persecution or vain glory, past even chaos or emptiness, into the very mystery of that continual flip of non-being into being. And can be the occasion of that great liberation when one makes the transition from being afraid of nothing to the realization that there is nothing to fear. This is what Lang says, that we are the medium through which the continual process of creation is happening. We are the beings, we are the mediums through which being is able to emerge from non-being. Wow! What a task. So the last sentence from Lang. From the point of view of a man alienated from his source, creation arises from despair and ends in failure. This is the description of the world up to the coronavirus, up to the old definitions of space, time, agency, the old definition of design. But leave it that back. But such a man has not trodden the path to the end of time, the end of space, the end of darkness, and the end of light. He does not know that where it all ends, there it all begins. So with that, I will leave you to mull over what we have been studying. I'm sorry that there were so many words in this presentation. Anupama, I think it might be good if a PDF of this is shared with the participants 
because they may want to read some of the things again if they felt so. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. I will share. So, uh, thanks a lot, sir, again for the wonderful and mesmerizing session, which uh, makes us make us actually think: Was it really happen, or this that pandemic situation shaped us, or, or as like you know, always disaster has shaped the human society always. So, I think this pandemic also shaped us a lot many ways. So, thanks a lot for this wonderful session. So now I would like to ask all the participants if they have any question, they can directly ask ask to sir. Uh, sir, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yes. Before before uh, everybody begins bombarding you with questions, I I am not sure if this is a question or this is a situation. Uh, we talked about uh, nature being creative or repetitive, uh, but we somehow uh, we see that the way uh, a, a tree bears a fruit mm. or a cuckoo calls, mm. or the way flowers bloom or mm. the birds make nest, yeah. uh, somehow it suggests that they have evolved to a certain level or reached to an equilibrium. Mm. While we are still not in sync with the process, or maybe we are distracted with an inward looking approach, mm. consuming data, power, meeting numbers, distancing as if we haven't already. Do we pause to look for a new way of life? How do we sync? Well, we have been forced to pause, no? There are we have been forced to pause. We are not together. We cannot meet each other. And we have to do everything from the same place, the same room, the same chair. And that has already asked us to rethink. It has also, if we are if we are open, it gives us an opportunity to feel and see things which we had ignored for a while. And so, yes, the pause is something, unfortunately, it had to be forced on us and not something which came naturally. But whatever it is, let us accept this pause with a positive sense that we transform the ways in which we work, the ways in which we feel, the ways in which we relate to everything around us. And then something new will come. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Uh, Savita ma'am is there. H Hello oh, yes. ma'am. <laughs> Hello. Hi Savita, how are you? I saw your name in the mail and I was so happy. Your voice is breaking. Uh, um, ma'am, your voice is breaking. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Yeah. I, um, in the, in the, I want because what um, I think it was just. And we can't hear you properly. Hello. Maybe, Manuel. maybe, uh, Savita, maybe the best thing will be that either you write something in the chat or you you send me a mail afterwards. I'm so okay. happy to see you after such a long time, yes, so many yes. years. Okay. Yeah, same. Same here, same here. <laughs> yeah.
Anupama, I tried to put the PDF in the chat. Is that the way to send, or shall I send it to you by mail? Uh, you are muted. You are muted. So you can share it in the chat box or you can mail mail me. So I will mail all the participants. Okay, let me try. Let all, me try. Yeah, although the session is also recording, sir. Yes, correct. That is yeah. true. They will be able to see that. Yeah, sure, sir. So, uh, sir, uh, there are, uh, meanwhile, there are many questions by the participants. Mm. So, there is one question by Professor Sridharan's wife, um, Damanti Sridharan, ma'am is there. Hello, ma'am. So, she is asking for a majority, there is no pause and they are uh, uh, driven by uh, compulsions. So, how does one uh, reconnickle re uh, the, the in inequalities? Mm. It's a very important question. And yes, who, who is responsible for the inequalities? If one, if one looks at the whole structure of things, then one is equally a participant in the world of inequality. And to the extent whatever one does, the action is it going to increase the inequalities or is it going to reduce the inequalities is a question one could ask that is one part of it the second part of it is that irrespective of how active one is the space for reflection always exists and it is a matter of an internal change that, say, in the studios, for example, if we are working with students, I find that encouraging the student to be very active and then reflective in sequences is something which helps to create a more, a more fluent uh, understanding. And so I think that in the world, we in our own ways have to work to reduce the inequalities and to uh, not use things which tend to increase the inequalities. But we also have to start creating the possibilities, even in our small ways. As somebody who is working with me, how does that person get the space for reflection? How is it possible that in my office I'm able to create this, this moment of reflection and not expect continual and frenzied action? So I know I cannot answer your question fully because its dimensions are huge, but some parts of it are already possible in our actions, in our daily actions. Uh, thank you, sir. So there is another question by Mani Vanan R. How do you see memory in the space-time continuum? I'll try to understand that question. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the memory is something which is um, which is thought to be something that happened, is finished, is gone, and only an intangible something of it has remained in your mind. Whereas actually memory might be something which is ingrained. For example, let's take a plank of wood. And if I look at the wood and I start planing it, as I plane it, I'm revealing the memories of its growth to my hand, to my planer, to the world, through the smell and the pattern that emerges. And that the memory is existent in my muscles 
and in the tree simultaneously and it is only revealing so that it's not something that's gone but it is coming into being at this moment and it is creating an anticipation of something else so that memory considered in one sense is like an engraving in your in your uh, neurons one very uh, different way of thinking about it. but another way of thinking about memory is something that is operative in every action no action is in the absence of memory and i think in the space time continuum that you are talking about it is something that is simultaneously existent action and memory are together that's how it is like uh i yes. hope uh, sir has answered your question so uh, ma'am uh, there is uh, uh, there is text written by uh, savita ma'am she is saying ki your talk is actually uh, talking about resonance we must become attended to this resonance respond to resonance and the landscape of new normal are also resonating with so many messages and indicators yep yeah i fully agree i fully agree and i you know savita has caught the most important word in the whole thing she has caught the word <laughs> resonance and it is that is the key word which made me write this thing in the way i have written it yeah so we are resonating we are resonating yeah yes there is from divya chandra uh, what yes, is sir. your yes. opinion on the notion of time especially when many activities in today's world are time bound hmm. yes you know i wake up every morning i feel hungry i eat something and then i go out into the world and there is a time for being hungry and there is a time for being sleepy and there is a so a body has a its time and uh, a project or or a activity where many human beings are together they have to coordinate in terms of time that by tomorrow we will finish so such and such and in a month's time we will be nearly there we will have done so much so time as a practical way of working together is not something which is the same as time which is thought of in terms of oh five years from now i will be a famous architect i hope it will be so that kind of time of psychological expectation is the time which is problematic and the time which is the practical time of working together is not a problem so notion of time is something which is it exists as something which is more in the mind than in in reality the physicists say there is no such thing they say that an electron can move back in time a quark can move back in time as a physicist and they are now saying forget it there's no such thing it's a it's a terrible shock that we get so i think we have to uh, relax in our understanding of time as something where yes we try to work together and therefore we will finish things in certain time as a as a kind of uh, mutual understanding and another one where i say i will not try to imagine the future i will stay right here doing what i'm doing or being as i am thank you sir so mm. there is one question by isha jain she is the um, master students of second year landscape yes so she is asking 
there was an iteration of the four words arising resonating growing and dissolving so my question is how do we students as young designers become a medium through which this process is taken forward through our designs how do we imbibe the essence of these words into our design language most important thing is being alive to what is that means you have a site you have a particular place you have a rock of a certain kind you have a geography which has had 100000 years of of history you have a somebody living on that you have three trees all of those things they start first and are we resonating to those actual things which are there and then out of that out of being simply listening to the site as it is there starts a kind of sprouting of responses of an arising of some kind of response which again resonates with other responses and things grow and then letting go the kind of uh, singularity of our decisions and dissolving this i think happens in every design process if you look at your own drawings you will find that unconsciously this is happening and you have to let it happen more by not trying to be somebody different from the others somebody ahead of the others somebody who is making something new but only listening i think with that a young student is more capable of doing this than old practitioners who have become hardened for you it's easier so isha i would say go ahead and just be ready ka and then saram vidya has asked a question yes sir yeah. should i read no it's fine i can read it uh, okay sir in recent times due to this virus we were forcibly at home to save ourselves in ancient time architecture and landscape both were at level of coexistence with nature but now it's now like that we are exploiting that nature so where do you see the best way of co coexistence with nature who decides what to do with nature is it us or is it somebody else are we giving up that oh it's the corporates and it is this and it is that it's only if one is greedy for big things that one finds that coexistence with nature is impossible start small and coexist and and participate and you will be recognized for being such a wonderful designer that nobody can take that away from you otherwise you will say oh, okay they want this they want this they want to exploit let me do in the best possible way then i think there is already a non coexistence so first in your own mind be be very happy that you can see this that you can start from there and from there something will happen once you start working from that position your work becomes of such quality that nobody can deny it or at least the people with whom you would like to work will not deny it and you will you will be able to do, make gardens make landscapes make wonderful places by doing this coexistence you know for landscape architects this is even better than for architects because architects they have to go and you know dig things and blast rocks and all this kind of thing whereas landscape architects they i i think 
uh, is something which is they're very fortunate that they can tell no 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 let us keep this let us add this let this grow let that grow let that thing happen and it will become something which is coexistence so saran i would not be at all pessimistic about it uh, i think we are running short of time so are there any more questions if there are any questions uh, please mail it to me so that i can mail it to sir to got the answers meanwhile sir please uh, sir please mail me the pdf so that i will share it with, I will do uh, with that. the participants i will do sure, that sir. yes sure sir sure sir okay so, uh, <laughs> are there any more questions any questions okay sir so thank you thank you savita ma'am do you want to say anything yes ma'am your voice is breaking hmm i speak in this and then i will hello ma'am we can't hear you properly yes yes i think i i have the message i already got the message thank you <laughs> yes so so thanks a lot for this mesmerizing <laughs> session we would like to hear more and more from you and it is it is my opportunity to have you on this platform again and again and this is the opportunity for spf bhopal also so thank you for uh, this wonderful session thank, thank you thank you all the participants as well thank you thank, thank you, you for giving thank me you. this opportunity to think yes <laughs> yes sir all right bye okay sir bye sir bye sir have a nice day sir Okay thank you all the participants bye bye we'll mail you the pdf as soon as possible bye everyone bye